Yes. Hi, Doug. Good morning. Hi, Jagat. How are you? Yes, good, good. And you are looking younger than last time I met you. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably because you're in Europe as well. Okay, perhaps you. international <laughs> trade keeps us young. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, friends, uh, uh, here we are uh, talking to uh, Doug, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Global Chamber. Uh, he is a chemical engineer and has a master's in management. And uh, I didn't know before, but I think many of you also may not know that he has got five patents to his name. Right, Doug? That's correct. Yeah, and he speaks four languages. This is also I did not know. So very rightly, global chamber is the right word. And, you know, he has worked with corporates like Johnson & Johnson and Phelps Dodge and Data Preserve and Growth Nation. And uh, then he started uh, Global Chamber, which I have always believed that it has been very ahead of time. It has been visionary. And uh, I don't know when he started Global Chamber, he must have thought about coronavirus. Right? <laughs> but <laughs> today, the whole world is uh, actually on the model on which uh, Global Chamber is being run. The whole world is following that. And it was very visionary. So, Doug, I would like to ask you some questions and uh, we would, I would like all the viewers, my followers, I have a million followers on my social media, various platforms, and I do a lot of work in India and abroad. I want them to know uh, about you and about Global Chamber. So, uh, first of all, uh, Doug, can you tell me wh where were you born and where uh, did you, uh, you know, wh where were you brought up? Sure. No, happy to answer that. And again, thank you for the opportunity to share with, with your community. I am an American. Um, my heritage is uh, German and Polish. Um, I was born in a place called Mount Kisco, New York, which they call upstate New York, which is only about 30 miles north of, of New York City. So um, my uh, great-grandmother, Paula Gertz, uh, a Brunke was the one that brought us to the New York area. Most of the Brunkies are, there's only about 200 of them in the U.S., a very unusual name. Most of them are in the Chicago area. My great-grandmother was the only one that diverted off to New York, and hence the Brunkies in New York are all part of my family. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> That's some history. Okay. So, uh, and, and where are you based now, the I'm based in two places, uh, so I've got a foot in Scottsdale, Arizona, U.S., and also Palo Alto, California, which you know is, is a little bit more famous. I've been very fortunate to have lived in a lot of different places, consider a lot of places my hometown, um, from, from New York originally uh, to Utah, Texas, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Japan, Michigan, Singapore, uh, Arizona. Uh, and, and, and now California as well. So I've been very fortunate to live in a lot of places um, and oh, some really good places as well. Okay, right. So, uh, Doug, tell me something about your career. Right? Like, which year did you start working? Where you worked? What were your functions and your other careers till, till you started Global Chamber? So it's actually been uh, coming up to my 40 years uh, uh, graduating from college and starting my career with the DuPont company. Um, I was had two different paths I could have taken. My dad was not an entrepreneur. Um, he was a very smart uh, electrical systems engineer. He actually worked on the U-2 spy plane, some very sophisticated, top secret government projects uh, through uh, IBM primarily, and he retired with IBM. He took a very traditional route. He always talked about starting up his own company, and he never did. Uh, my grandfather, my mom's father, however, was entrepreneurial. So he was 50 years old working as a machinist at a shop by far the best person in the New York City area doing that kind of work with a partner who owned the business. And one day my grandfather overheard him at lunch say, oh, Joe, he's never going to be a part owner. So my grandfather heard that, my grandfather Joseph brings, and he left. He picked up his lunch, he left the building, 
never talked to Mr. Meyer oh, wow. again. He <laughs> went home. He nailed uh, a nail into the wall in the basement. And my grandmother came down and was like, Joe, what are you doing home? What's going on? He says, I'm starting my own business. 50 wow. years old. My mother was 12. My, my uncle was eight. And my, my grandmother started crying saying, Joe, no, no, go back to work immediately. This is crazy. You have kids, you have a family. This is not the right time to do this. And kind of long story short, my grandfather, uh, my pops, what we call him, uh, really was my mentor for most of my life. I've watched him be very successful in his business. He retired. He became the oldest person in New York State to become a pilot, to get a pilot's license. Very dynamic, very entrepreneurial, and really was kind of my dream. So contrary to my father, um, I, I would say my grandfather really got me to become the entrepreneur eventually that I became. Wow, this is like a, a script for a film. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah, right. Okay, so Doug, uh, you have five patents, right? Wow. I, so I how, do. How, do, how, do, how did that come about? So one of the great things about uh, having an interesting business career is you get to hang out with some really smart people like you. Um, <laughs> and you. so I, I, I've always been a mingler. I've always been a connector. And so, as you mentioned, I'm a chemical engineer originally. So I'm not really a classic chemical engineer. Um, I'm somebody who's more around uh, involved with um, being a catalyst, being a chemical catalyst between people and ideas. And so I hired into DuPont out of college as a chemical engineer, and it was a program that required that I move every two years, different programs, different location. And so I ended up as part of that, my third assignment, they said, hey, we have an idea. Let's bring an engineer into our central research department. So this was DuPont's big place where they've invented Teflon and nylon. In fact, I worked in the building where uh, Wallace Carruthers invented nylon. Oh, um, okay. They said, let's, let's bring an engineer in there and have him manage the really smart people because the smart people, they're, they're, they're just doing stuff off track. They need to be more focused in on commercial applications. We need to invent another nylon, another Teflon. So let's, let's put Doug in there as a guinea pig. Um, so <laughs> basically, I was a supervisor of people. One guy had 84 patents. Another guy had 50-something patents. They're brilliant people. And so all I really needed to do was go into work. And, and <laughs> lo and behold, through, through that activity, there were five patents, mainly on chlorofluorination chemistry, which nobody knows about. But what you may know about is it kind of was a, a byproduct of the Freon. Some of us are old enough. You're too young, Jagat. But when Freons were a bad thing, and basically DuPont was the main supplier of that, yes. when they were looking for alternatives to Freon, it ended up being chlorofluorochemistry. 134A was the alternative. And out of that chemistry came the work that I was doing that turned out to be a variety of different products. But hanging out with smart people is always a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, you know, uh, Doug, I met you in 2017 in U.S. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I used to wonder, and even now I wonder, so there are all these chambers of commerce in all the cities, right? In my city, in your city, we have got chamber of commerce, which uh, primarily works with the locals, and they have some connection with outside. Then we have bilateral chambers of commerce. So we have Indo-US chamber, maybe, or Indo-German uh, chamber. So these, these chambers, they work country to country. Very few, I don't know any, Maybe you, you can correct me, but I don't know any which is multilateral chamber between many countries. So when I met you first time, when I understood your business model, I was like zap. And I had never known. I have been in international business for 25 years. I had never known that, you know, this multilateral uh, kind of a chamber. So that was a, that was an amazing thing. So what I want to know, Doug, is when and how did you first think about this innovative and unique concept of global chamber? There were a couple key things associated with the development of it. I think certainly one is my own personality. I'm very global. Um, I think in global. And part of that is I've lived in so many places. And I 
in each place, there's always people that say, oh, our place is the best. And hmm. I've lived in so many places. Quite honestly, I'm not sure what's best. There's so many great <laughs> places. I've traveled okay. to India and across India. There's amazing things there. You know, the temples, the people, the food, it's extraordinary. If I actually had lived there yet, and maybe I will. Um, you know, it would be another hometown that would that would be impressive. So global people like myself typically have a, a, a bug, if you will, uh, for travel. And, and we think maybe outside of countries, outside of regions and think about the commonalities between people. So I think that's that was one thing. Another thing was uh, a senator, a former senator for the state of Arizona, his son stood up in a meeting uh, about, what, 12 years or so ago, and said, we need to keep foreigners out of Arizona because they take our jobs. And so as a Globy and as someone, I think, who understands how America got to be what it is, is immigrants are a key. That's my family are immigrants. Immigrants have created most of the Fortune 500 companies. The people want, historically, people have wanted to live in the U.S. And so he was wrong. Uh, or I believe he's totally wrong. So I said, hey, I've got to start something. I've got to start educating people that immigration and foreign investment and doing international business is the way. So I started once a month doing a, a traditional type of uh, group that said, hey, let's, let's talk about exporting. Let's talk about foreign direct investment. The last piece of the third piece was I drove to San Diego from Arizona. So it's about five and a half, six hours drive to a World Trade Center event uh, in San Diego. And so I drive these six hours to a wine and cheese event that I thought would be, hey, I get to meet the international community of San Diego. So I was tired and I was cranky and I got there and the, the cheese wasn't very good and the wine was <laughs> terrible. And it was a, a group of people that were not the Jagat Shahs of San Diego, if there are, probably nobody is a Jagat Shah of San Diego, but they were kind of not really inspiring people. And I thought to myself, yikes, you know, as an international person, this is not a way to do business. This is not a way to interact and find contacts and resources and clients. It's a needle in a haystack. There's got to be a better way. So I think those three elements were kind of key for Global Chamber to finally launch five years ago. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that, that's some background to Global Chamber. Very interesting. Yeah, your logic is very correct. So, so Doug, which was the first chapter you started and where? And which was so we actually did three pretty much all at once over a two week period of time. So in November of 2014, so a little bit over five years ago, we launched in um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, which is mm -hmm. you know the Metro Phoenix area uh, where I'm based in Scottsdale is within the Phoenix metro area. Uh, Tucson, Arizona, which is about a two hour drive south. So between Tucson and Phoenix, they cover the entire state of Arizona, about 7 million people. And the third chapter that launched right about the same time was Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, which uh, basically covers the entire state. And I'm trying to remember, I think there's about five or six million people within the state of, of Arizona. So three relatively small, but important places, all of which I know very well. And that was a kind of a key is, you know, I want to start this thing with uh, areas that where I have a lot of contacts myself, so I can get some traction early and kind of go from from there. Okay, so when when was your first uh, overseas chapter launched, and where was it? So so that's that was a kind of a weird situation because you know I've lived in Japan, and right. and so Tokyo was an important piece of. I figured very early on. So uh, turned out within the first year of Global Chamber, the first year I would say was pretty tied up with getting the systems and the, the website and working on shifting from a free service to a pay service. So there was a pretty much of a year of working on the processes. But after about a year, we started thinking, hey, let's build this. So we hosted the ambassador for Japan uh, in Arizona. Um, uh, so the, the Japanese ambassador to the U.S. 
Um, and it was a great event. It was spectacular. And in that, he brought several people in his delegation, one of whom was very business-oriented fellow. Um, and lo and behold, we had the conversation. He very well connected in Japan, like we try to find people that are really deeply connected. And uh, Nobuo became our uh, Global Chamber Tokyo chapter, and, and off we went in an overseas direction. So I don't remember how many chapters we had by then. One of the keys early on was not to be U.S.-centric. There is a U.S. chamber that, as an American, I find a little bit almost offensive, but, but in a way that any country is, right? Every country is very, we call it in the U.S., we're a homer. We're, we root for the home team. Everything is in the U.S. chamber is for the U.S. And we all know in our own countries, we have organizations that are for our own country, and that's great. Uh, what we're for, however, is trade everywhere. And so my, my focus has been differentiating ourselves from those groups, but collaborating. So we collaborate with the U.S. Chamber. We collaborate with Jetro in Japan. We collaborate with MIDA, the Malaysian Investment Development Agency. We collaborate with those groups that are, quote unquote, homers, trying to get investment or helping their, their companies succeed. We love that. We think that's great. They do great work and work that we can't do, but they can't do a lot of the things that we do that's cross-border or credibility uh, between, um, let's say, any country uh, that's, uh, say, Malaysia. I love the Malaysians and what they do, but when they're talking to an American, there's a little bit of a skeptical view, but if an American starts talking about Malaysia, that's a different story. It's like, yeah, right. yeah you need to consider it. So, so there are roles like that that Global Chamber plays that we love playing and, and, and we love collaborating with all of those groups. Okay, excellent. So when you opened your first uh, overseas chapter in Japan, what was the biggest challenging task you faced? Like what was the biggest challenge to get it uh, running and acceptable? I would say it's probably momentum to what you said earlier about kind of the way things are, you know, the typical chambers, the typical way we've, we've always done things. You know, in Japan, it was actually a little bit even more than that. Um, one of the driving forces for me with Global Chamber is, is creating or sharing best practices across countries. So one of the best practices, I think, is having women play a role in business. You know, there's no reason why women can't have a role um, uh, in doing business. I learned that in when I was running a joint venture in Japan earlier in my career, where we had the smartest person in really probably the company, but certainly in our Osaka office, uh, was an office lady, what they call an OL. And I said, you know, you should get her in sales. We need to do, we need more help in sales. And they said, right. there's no way in the world she can do sales. Mm -hmm. Toyota will never buy from a woman is what I was told. <laughs> so, which, you know, it's like, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's got, that gotta be wrong. So those of you who have done work in Japan know to get people to change very often, instead of just saying, no, this is going to be it. We actually, several months, I went out to dinner and did a lot of drinking with these people to say, look, you know, we got to try this. You know, uh, my, my name and reputation is on the line. Believe me, we'll, we'll make this work. And lo and behold, they tried it. And, you know, no surprise. She was the best salesperson they ever had. <laughs> so, so we tried to get that to happen. And so in Tokyo, however, our chapter has been a little bit behind the curve around understanding the value and understanding about working with women in leadership. Um, and, and so I've had to do a little bit of that on the side. And so I would say the normal stuff with countries of the traditional chambers and trying to be able to collaborate with them is always an issue, but issues around cultural behaviors and things like that, that to me seem natural, like women in the workplace, you know, are areas too, where I think are both challenges, but I think ultimately are great opportunities. Absolutely. In fact, I, when we were talking, I recall when I was doing this mentor on road trip in US. Uh, so <clears throat> that time I was also promoting uh, this United Nations women program called uh, 50-50 by 2030, where their goal is to have 
gender equality. So that's quite an interesting background you told about Japan. So Doug, how many chapters do you have now operational across the world? In so how many way, countries? So it, it was actually an intern the summer before we launched. So uh, almost six years ago now, uh, she actually went through the whole world and split it up into 525 plus minus chapters. And so what we call a chapter is um, an area, a metro area of at least a million. Um, okay. Many times they're much larger than that, but at least a million, and it includes the surrounding area. So that's why the state of Arizona, there's two chapters. The state of Indiana is roughly the same population, but there's only one chapter. It's in Indianapolis, but it covers the entire state. There's actually 92 counties so Indiana split into okay. 92 more sub-segments, uh, but our person in Indiana has actually been to all 92. Wow. Some of the other chapters are, are Tokyo, very large. You know, Jakarta, very large. Mumbai, very large. So they range, or another, probably the biggest one is the country of Cameroon. So the mm -hmm. chapter of Douala, cap, Douala captures all of the country of uh, Cameroon, which is, I believe, around 30 million plus people very little bit different business. So the 525 has really stayed. And so we have members in almost all of them. Wow. And we help almost all of them. When we originally started, we thought, well, we should have two prices, one for chapters where there's a person on our team and other chapters where there's just a member. But what we found was when there's a member there, we can actually connect them to around the world. We can give them an opportunity to speak in presentations. And so the value for them is, is almost as high as a chapter that has actually events. And now that we're not doing events locally because of the COVID-19, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's more equivalated, equilibrated the whole system. So really we've got 525 chapters. We're everywhere in the world, every country, except uh, a couple countries where we're not allowed to do business. Oh, okay. Right. That's amazing. I, I don't know of any equivalent uh, chamber or organization in the world uh, with such kind of a reach. Congratulations. So Doug, uh, what type of companies and professionals uh, join as member with the Global Chamber? My audience would like to know like, uh, what type of companies would uh, do you have in your membership base? So the, 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 there's three, three main groups. So the main focus and the target that we look for for Global Chamber are exporters, uh, and within that group, we would also lump in importers and cross-border investors. So that's the, the main group. It's the actual people doing business across borders. Those are our peeps. That's the global tribe um, uh, focus for, for Global Chamber. So we help them do their international business. Uh, the second layer around that are service providers. So these are the banks and the lawyers and consultants of every ilk. Um, that want to meet the exporters, want to meet the importers, want to meet the, the cross-border investors because they have a service that they often don't know about, but they can be, they can benefit from. So, so that's the kind of the second tier. And then the third tier are groups uh, that would be a variety. So it's universities and economic development organizations within cities and, and provinces and states and countries and a variety of other people who are kind of the, the part of the ecosystem. So together, the core group that are led by exporters, the secondary group are the service providers, and then the other group, that's what we call the global tribe. So the people like you, Jagat, who walk through life with your international filter and almost everything you see is through that cross-cultural, cross-border filter. Most people in the world don't have that. They have a Correct. very local focus. You have that global perspective and, and one of the reasons why we collaborate so well. So thank you for all you do and thank you for the appreciation for that basic model of helping people be more successful. The world is a tricky place and it's harder to do that work overseas. And so our vision and our mission is, how do we make selling across borders just as easy as selling across the street? Even easier, and I think it can be.
true absolutely you on the dot you mentioned and uh, the, the the i mean the, the those three layers which you mentioned covers very very wide range of uh, companies so that is quite interesting so now if you have to say three things uh, if someone wants to be a member what are the three things they benefit so number one and first and foremost it's always been a key part of global chamber is we want to understand your business so we always have an onboarding conversation and when we onboard we're asking primarily who are you targeting as a client who do you want and so we actually have about a three page questionnaire that we have on our side we don't bother the members with that but we use that three page to really dig deep onto understanding that so so we have a, a network of 35 million people around the world that we can introduce our members to. The key then is two things. One is keep growing that network of people that we know. And number two is as members come on, let's understand who they want to meet and make those introductions. So if they're in India and they want to grow into Europe and they have a certain type of product and a certain type of company that they want to be introduced to, we make the warm introduction. So number one, is the warm introduction and this beats all of the cold stuff that happens out in the world Absolutely. the warm introduction doesn't guarantee a sale but 90 percent of the time there's at least a conversation and that's really all most businesses want is just give me a chance to tell people what we're doing and to match it up with what somebody needs and invariably a sale happens over time so that's by far number one number two especially for service providers, is exposure. So they very often, even I've had Bank of America tell me, hey, not enough people know what we do. It's like, wow, if, if Bank, America, Bank of America <laughs> has that challenge, imagine what a, a, a law firm with a few lawyers or a variety of other, anybody that has a service. Most people don't know what people do. And they end up making a lot of either mistakes or errors of omission because they didn't know about that financing program. They didn't know that you could do that with your exports. They didn't know that you have to do certain things with compliance relative to those products. And so the, the exposure of service providers to the exporters and the community is critically important. And then, you know, last but not least is being part of the global tribe. So to your point, there's really no other organization that holistically looks at people who are thinking cross-border and and have a community of people who are helping each other grow their business. There's nothing like it. The closest thing, <clears throat> and actually one of my inspirations was Thunderbird School of Global Management. They do a really good job of, of getting their graduates to be very close to each other and connected to each other. And one of the things that always... Uh, uh, really uh, impressed me. They used to have a campus in Glendale, Arizona. And Glendale, Arizona is probably the least international place you'd ever want to be. There's like nothing international there, except Thunderbird was there. So you'd go onto okay. this campus that you kind of drive off, you find eventually this road that was called Global Way. And then now you're on this other world place where everybody's global, everybody's from somewhere else, everybody's mm -hmm. talking about international everybody has a passion for global and then you leave and you're back into society back into that place where nobody cares you know they're only cared about local so when i saw that i thought wow wouldn't it be great to have something like that more holistically where you know yeah thunderbird is amazing people should go to thunderbird but what if you don't go to thunderbird i, I didn't go to thunderbird and i feel that way why can't others do that as well um and so so those were some of the things that our members get and so being part of the global tribe is is not trivial because the other people that are around you know global business they love global business they're passionate about global business they want to help you with your global business and and that's an important thing amazing right right in fact uh, to all my audience i would like to tell that uh, uh, you know, I have myself personally benefited with a lot of introductions from Global Chamber. So these warm introductions, which uh, Doug mentioned about, they work amazing because, you know, people do business with people first. So the moment there is an introduction from someone, then it goes to the company, then it goes to the product or service, and then it is price. So 
people to people referencing and connectivity is i have personally benefited so i can vouch for that thank you for the, uh, that uh, explanation dad so dad uh, what, what is your most memorable success story uh, example of a global chamber from members point of view it stands uh, out in your mind sure there there there's every day is fun at global oh, chamber yeah. because every yes. day we get to see success and create more success but i but thinking about uh, that um one of my favorite examples is actually a very hot business right now telemedicine so telehealth you know is is a great example of an industry and a technology that was a no brainer is a no brainer we should have used telemedicine before but here sort of like global chamber i think to some extent right it's like yeah you should be doing this but now that you can't meet people in person you can't get on a plane and fly somewhere very easily um telemedicine makes a lot of sense and so one of our members global med um uh they were interested in and they continue to be interested in new countries and so we made an introduction to someone i've known for a long time in argentina uh the number one health system within argentina so this seemed natural right a telemedicine company from the us hooked up with argentina where they have a passion for new technology and and they were very interested in this and so they start working together it starts moving forward success right so except here's here's the other element of global chamber that i want to i want to share it's more than just the warm introduction so so maybe 2 or 3 months maybe 4 months later i get a call from argentina dug we need to talk Oh, okay. Yeah, anytime. So Ricardo's he's on the I think it was a WhatsApp call. He says, "We've got a big problem. Things are off the track. They're not listening to us. They're way behind on schedule." And so he a litany of things. It's like, "Oh my god." Okay. Right. So now and you I'm sure this way you got if you've made an introduction to somebody, you're you're kind of in there, yes. right? You have, yes, you, you want to make sure that they're both legit and they're yes. they're they're real people and you don't want anything to go wrong. And so I get on the I I I call the CEO of the the telemedicine company on my cell phone right away after the call. It's like Joel, we got a problem. There's he's a what? I I can't believe it. I thought everything was going well. So lo and behold, after a couple of days of sorting through, there were some issues. Over several weeks, there were things that were done back and forth between Argentina and the US and it turned out the US company ended up not within those weeks but within a couple months fired a couple people there were some things that were not oh. quite right going okay. on not unethical but things that were not being listened to and and so fast forward a couple three months i start hearing positive signs that things are back on track and lo and behold they did launch successfully both both the companies involved are amazing but there was some project challenges that happened and we got involved to to make sure that you know it was a successful project and both members are happy and and uh, actually both members just uh, renewed in the last couple months so so those are the kinds of things we do get involved with and we mention about warm introductions but we really care about the companies and we want them to succeed very nice very interesting example because yeah you are right you know the moment you do an introduction it also becomes a moral responsibility to see to it that it uh, reaches it reaches its conclusion and whenever there are there are any hurdles and this is something which generally other chambers do not do this is what i have seen the, the chambers do not play that role so this is the most i think very very another powerful angle of uh, global chamber so dug uh, the i i was looking at your website our, the website of global chamber and i saw many sponsors also there like ups and Uh, you had arranged uh, my one of my meetings there uh, in their office it was amazing experience so how how do these sponsors uh, benefit and how, how do they connect so they're the the sponsors and most of the people in that sponsor list are typically that second layer the service providers that okay. want exposure to right. to the right. exporters and so okay, whether it. it's the logistics and banks and lawyers and <clears throat> places like that Okay. And so what they're looking for is exposure so you know by hosting right. a Jagat Shah what better exposure could they ever receive right. than okay. getting exposure from Jagat Shah and the companies right. that you're bringing to the US 
Also, right. you know, there's a variety of things that we do. There's a law firm, for instance, in uh, the U.S. based in Detroit, Dickinson Wright. And really, one of their attorneys is by far the, the most intelligent, the most knowledgeable, the most articulate at USMCA, which is the new NAFTA uh, between the agreement, yeah, right. trade agreement between Canada, U.S. and Mexico. And so he takes a very and has taken multiple times a very complicated topic and makes it very clear to our members about what's happening. And now that it's actually happening, it's happening July 1st. Right, right. He's, he's holding an event in a couple of days that um, where, in fact, between now and July 1st, he's talking about that for companies and what they need to do. They actually need to do some things. And so as a visionary sponsor that Dickinson Wright is, we, we help our members understand that they need to be connected to this. They need to listen. They need to be part of this. And so those are some of the things that we do, whether it's the UPSs or the Dickinson Wrights or the Bank of Americas who are there that um, whatever they end up doing, if they're doing some, some projects, uh, another one is another law firm, Esquire Patent Boggs, that um, does a lot of work right now with COVID-19 and keeping members, keeping companies aware of what the opportunities are relative to government uh, programs, things like that. So we're getting, our, we're getting the word out about what Squire Patent Boggs is doing, and hence we're giving them some exposure. And ultimately, what happens, of course, is you know they get they get more clients themselves. Okay, that's interesting. So, Doug, I I, I have known your passion and you know your commitment to Global Chamber, and uh, that that itself is is uh, your extended family. But I would also like to know about your family members of your family. What do they do? What of support you got from them in Global Chamber, particularly in the initial years. Okay, well, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see. I would say, just uh, maybe, just as a general uh, description, is that I am the oldest child. So, as an oldest child, I tend to be the responsible one, right? The one who does uh, right. looks out or tries to look out for everybody. Also, my mother always called me the smart one. So my brother was the handsome one. I was the smart one. My younger brother was the handsome one. And then and the my tall younger sister. I'm sorry? Also the tall one. Well, actually, my brother and I are both tall. Uh, okay. In fact, okay. he's actually taller than I. So probably okay. why he's okay. more handsome than me. Uh, right. And then my sister was the girl. So we each had our own little classification. Uh -huh. So I think... You know, being labeled the smart one, you know, set, you know, the expectation high. So when I was looking for a college degree, being a chemical engineer is a tough degree and it was yeah. one of the harder ones. And so that inspired me to kind of get there. I mentioned about my really strong mentor, my grandfather. Um, he passed away uh, within a few weeks of my first international trip. So oh. really, um, I won't. Great that he actually saw that I did my right. first trip uh, 33 years ago, uh, right. and he passed away two weeks later. So I got to at least chat with him about, you know, what, what I had done. But he had already kind of put in me that entrepreneurial spirit. So it took another 30 years almost for me to start Global Chamber. But, but he, he was very supportive along the way. And then I would say... Another key supporter, especially more recently, is my wife, uh, who I've been married to for 38 years. Wow. She works in the business. She always, always, and especially in the beginning, wondered how crazy I was to do this <laughs> thing that she didn't fully understand in the beginning. She at least understands a lot more of it um, and, and at least tolerates my, my passion for it uh, and, 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 and is supportive. I, I'm being somewhat sarcastic. And then finally, my daughter, um, we have one daughter. She was always told me she'd never liked business, uh, that she thought that was a bad thing. And she ended up becoming a nurse and a, now a nurse practitioner. So she's a healthcare person. She's total that kind of a person, but right. she does have one little shred of entrepreneurial element in her. It turns out she married a guy who has three startups and he works for Tesla as an executive. No. So, so she is definitely a caregiver on the healthcare right. side. And she's an amazing yeah. one. She's on the front lines in California in Palo yeah. Alto at Stanford University. And she has this one little thing 
where uh, Jimmy, her new husband, uh, is very entrepreneurial. So, you know, my wife and my daughter have been very supportive over the years. We've had a great life together, uh, living internationally. And uh, uh, so I would say certainly they continue to be very supportive. Excellent. Please convey my respects to your wife and my salute to your daughter because, you know, the kind of work uh, healthcare professionals are doing in America is amazing. You know, it is putting themselves in the line of, uh, you know, direct line and amazing. I mean, uh, for centuries, people are going to remember this and be very absolutely. thankful. I agree. Everywhere so, around the world. Absolutely. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, so Doug, what are your hobbies? Well, you can kind of tell that, you know, I'm an international business guy. So things that surround international business are, are typically hobbies. So eating and traveling and uh, cross-cultural activities, you know, uh, arts related to cross-cultural. Um, I've been a golfer over the years. Um, you know, I remember very vividly golfing in some countries around the world and being fairly tall again. And being, you know, the foreigner very often amongst many local people, I've always tended to stand out a little bit um, and uh, and put put pressure on my golf game because <laughs> I'm, right. I'm not that great. Uh, right. But, but I, I've always enjoyed it and I've always enjoyed getting out. And of course, I love the camaraderie of building relationships uh, with uh, with people, whether it's our own team, whether it's uh, companies that we're doing business with and really... I think a key part of my own thinking is I think of them together. You know, I think of our team as, you know, our team, but it's somewhat in, it's hard to differentiate between ourselves and the clients, ourselves and our members. You know, we're all one family and hence the global tribe. And so those are some of the kind of the perspectives I think that, that have brought um, what is the unique global chamber. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So, so Doug, uh, we are coming to the closing uh, comments, but what are the three things you would like to see Global Chamber chapters doing uh, after COVID and all this uh, things settle down and the lockdown and is over and work starts? What, do you, what would you want them to be doing? Three things. So, you know, we want to continue the global expansion and I've been very heartened to, to hear from places that I hadn't heard from yet around the world that are people interested to know more about Global Chamber and to start chapters in their local area. Typically what we look for in a, in a region is a person who is glo has a global mentality, but they're also very well connected. That helps us build the, the network internationally. So I want to continue to see that. And you know, I'm hoping and expecting I've got another 20 or 25 years of activity with Global Chamber. So I certainly well before that want to see in the next five to 10 years, all 525 chapters fully built out, fully active with many, many members, hundreds of members with each one. That's really what I'd, what I'd, I'd love to see. And then Sometime along that shorter term period, I would love to be able to turn over the, the, my CEO role to others and have the management of the team you know, be self-sufficient and continue to move on while I still am allowed to be part of Global Chamber. I mean, I, I want to be the person that continues to build the chapters and to find people, to support people, to help members, to build connections. You know, one of the things, uh, the, and I would say the third thing, is the beyond the warm connections, which largely, I'd say 80% of the time are people that we know and we kind of use that in our head. The other 20% are through the system, through artificial intelligence that we find warm connections. And I see that flipping so that we've got maybe at some point 80% of the warm introductions we make are actually through the technology, through artificial intelligence that takes what people are looking for, looks through the database and starts making connections, warm connections that I think artificial intelligence can do. And in fact, we've already started to demonstrate that where the artificial intelligence that we're using through gazelle.ai and other techniques that we use are very effective we still have to filter a little bit, but it's still very beneficial. So I, so those are the, I would say the three things. And I really do see that 
given the global perspective that we have, that we are uniquely positioned to allow that artificial intelligence to to come into the, the, the prospecting for our members and, and make them more successful. And so continued success for our members is always number one in our minds. Oh, wow. Okay, wonderful. So this is my last question, Doug, that what message would you like to give to global businesses, businesses around the world on life after COVID? So, uh, you know, I think one of, you can, you can make two conclusions from COVID. Um, you know, and I think the wrong conclusion is that we need to shelter down forever and, and close borders and do less globalization. That's the absolutely wrong right. conclusion. And in so, fact, it's exactly why I started Global Chamber. When someone says we need to keep foreigners out of Arizona, that also was the wrong conclusion. We so, see that and we'll always have that in every country, by the way that I've ever been. There's always some fraction of people that are ultra nationalist and want to kind of close the borders or maybe they're not ultra nationalist. Some of them are just, hey, you know, let's go back to with a simple life where we're just kind of you and me on our street. And there's some attraction to that. The sustainability is very important, but ultimately the answer is that we're more connected than ever. And being more connected than ever means there's more opportunities than ever. So whether it's the personal protective equipment that we're seeing float around back, right. back and forth across borders or products or technologies, I think it's going to be primarily technologies that go back and forth that allow us to be more effective, live better lives everywhere in the world. We can't in any country invent everything ourselves. Oh. It's you look at what South Korea has done in terms of some of what they've done and how they've handled COVID-19. They're a model for around the world. Singapore has also done some good things and some bad things as well. So, so it's really important that we learn from each other, that we um, um, work together. And more than ever, I'm committed to and believe that globalization, the way we view it, where businesses are finding opportunities around the world, is expanding and will increase after COVID-19. So number one conclusion is be global. Think about how your products and service will be used going forward because ultimately don't let the cross-cultural aspects and maybe the way people look, the way they dress or the food they eat or the clothes or their skin color or all the superficial things, all of that really is superficial. What's real is we're all the same. Underneath, we all That's want amazing. our children to be better amazing. than us. That's we we all want to have a roof over our heads. We all want to leave a mark. We don't want to just go underneath the ground and not have an impact. Um, we all want to have that impact. We all want to give back to the world. If we're allowed to do that, we'll do it. We want that. It's a human nature. Right. Maslow talked about it in his hierarchy. That's a human value. And so I would say COVID, especially like when I see Jagat, your daily messages about the lockdown, you're talking uh, about what's happening to you in India, but yes. those are things that are happening to us in the US and to yes. people in Italy. You know, those are human values. Those are human emotions. We, so more than ever, we're connected. And so it took God and his perhaps infinite <laughs> wisdom to bring Yes, a tremendous tragedy on people, but I think whether it's the whole the ozone hole filling in for the world or fish being seen in the Venice canals or the air to be cleaned up across most of Asia or people to recognize that we are humanly connected in a in a more fundamental way maybe than we could have ever imagined that sets opportunity for us. And so that's, we at Global Chamber certainly are looking at that as an opportunity for companies to take advantage of the world as their marketplace to improve the lives of people and to continue to build now this gift to some extent that we've been given so that we make the world a better place. Excellent. Wonderful. Doug, it was amazing speaking to you. I've known you for more than three years, but today what I came to know about you is amazing. And, you know, I've always believed that the personality of a company 
or an organization comes from the personality of the promoter or the leader so you know everything what you said is actually i, I can see that in global chamber so it is very reflective of uh, uh, you know what you do and uh, again congratulations and best wishes uh, for global chamber to grow all over the world and uh, my audience i want to tell you friends that uh, uh, you have heard the person the founder and ceo of global chamber a very exhaustive uh, information he has given and background and i will uh, motivate you to go to the website of global chamber and see the activities and join as a member we business people we have to take these opportunities which are coming in front of us we have to act on it if information comes to us and we don't act i always tell people that it is almost criminal because when we are running businesses we are responsible to so many people who are working with us their families their careers and therefore whenever an opportunity whenever you, every entrepreneur has a common sense when you look at something you can make out yes this is good for me this is not good for me so go into it check it out you heard the founder and his passion and join as member it is an amazing networking platform i have been beneficial and you have heard from the horses mouth today so uh, kindly join up and uh, dug will be in touch with you when you join up to all this chapter uh, ambassadors and uh, all the best to everybody and thank you dug once again and do convey my regards to all the global tribe members uh, leaders and your family thank you thank you so much thank you jaga thank you